much. All right, well, before we get started here, what we're going to talk about, I'm going to say this line. You're going to repeat back. You know what you need to do. You've got to say it out as loud as you can. God is good. Excellent. Please stay standing for a minute, though, because we got something else important. Very important. We have to say this together. Are we ready? Get that slide up. All together, I will not wear scented products to church. All right, we're doing that. If you're new here, and I know we got somebody that's new here, we do that because we've got some people that come here that are very, very allergic and have to go to the hospital if it's too much. So please don't wear anything. That would be great. You can, well, no, yeah, you can, you can sit down, but I'm going to ask you to stand up in a minute here in a second. But sit down, please. Sit down. Yeah. And let's give it up. Band did a great job today. Man, good job. I was particularly taken aback by that drummer today. He was something special. Hey, Claude, Claude, we thank you for your, we thank you for your faithfulness here at the church, man. Great job, excellent, and every the whole team did a great job today. It was really good. So we, I will not wear scented products to the church. It reminded me of this. How do you stop a skunk from smelling? Come on, hold its nose. Come on, that was good. Hey. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, it's pretty bad. Well, okay, well, we're going to talk today, we're in week two of our wisdom series, and we're starting in this series, seven weeks of wisdom, and looking through the books of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and other passages in the Bible as well, but focusing in on that area, but wisdom for our lives. Uh, just a recap from last week so that we can build on that of last week. We talked about how important wisdom is for our lives and how it can provide for us joy, purpose, prosperity, diminish our anxiety, give us the tools for a successful and a happy life. And we were thinking about wisdom itself and, and how we might be able to find that. And I figured there was three ways that we could find wisdom for our lives. First of all, it was to test and experience every single thing and determine what's best. And as we thought that through a little bit, we discovered that that's not the best plan to life. Because as we test things that could actually be potentially really bad for you, and that could create consequences that could extend far longer than the little testing period. And I gave an example of hard drugs, right? I said, you don't have to do hard drugs to know that it's probably going to be good for you. For A, for your wallet. Next, secondly, for your health and your relationships. So we, we don't, that's not necessarily the best place to find wisdom. And then we... we thought about uh, another area of finding wisdom was relying on experts. And we discovered that that wasn't also the best place to find wisdom for our lives because, say, you were going to get heart surgery, you wouldn't ask the expert in bricklaying to come and be your heart surgeon, right? Experts can't be experts on every single thing in our lives, even though I know we have family members like that, right? <laughs> and then finally, we decided the best place to find wisdom was to go to God in the Bible, he was the one that created knowledge. He gave us the capacity to be able to discover things and find wisdom. We've discovered that the Bible is the best place to find that for our lives. Remember, going back, we want wisdom because it's the best place for success for our lives. And we finished off that whole thing last week with this idea that we, we want to fear God. It's the first place to finding wisdom. Fear God isn't about terrifying, being terrified. It's about respecting God. First place for, for finding wisdom is surrendering your heart and your life to him and then following his path for your life. So today, we're going to be talking about the next part of our wisdom series and we are going to be talking about relationships. But before we do that, I want you to stand up. I want you to find three people and here's what I want you to do. Three people, or no, sorry, one person. Three people will be too much. Find, find another person, but I want you to discuss this and come up with this. What are the top three most important things in life? Your neighbor, whoever it is around you, if you're far from somebody, go find somebody. Discuss for me. you got one minute, and I want you to discover, and I want you to tell me what are the top three most important things in life. All right? Go. Find three people. Or sorry, find one person. Three things. Top three things. Most important things in life. Oops. Think big picture. Think big picture, Okay. Top three things. The 
big picture top three things. If you're watching online or listening on the radio, we're discussing, I want you to think in your mind what are your top three most important things in life. If you're at the end of your life and you have to decide what are the most important things, what are they? Okay, so now, yeah, you've discussed, you've come up with your top three, just keep them to yourselves, but I'm going to ask, Dave, would you be comfortable coming up? All right, come on up. I'm just, you're going to share with me your top three things you guys decided were top three. All right, we've got a guinea pig on the stage, everybody. If you're listening on the radio, yeah. There you go, buddy. All right, so you're going to share for everybody what you discovered are your top three things in life that are most important. This, this was not planned. You can, yeah, you can do it, buddy. So my number one thing is God. Without God, I don't have anything that I have. Hey, good answer, yeah. Number two is my sobriety, so my 12-step program. Hey. Without that, I don't have anything else. So without that, I'll lose my family, I'll lose my friends, I'll lose my job, I'll lose absolutely everything else. So that's number two. And... Family, family. I share. There's a lot of things, but I, I went with family. That's for good. my third, third option. Yeah. Uh, awesome. I used, I used to love, I used to like him. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent job. Was that part of your top three? Any of those you picked up on? Yeah. Yeah. You know what was interesting about your top three? And what we're going to be talking about today is this. And this is what I found when I was doing a search on this. What are the top three most important things in life? Now, you mentioned God was the most top th one of the top three most important things. You know, in, in the surveys that I discovered, God wasn't on the top three, right? And these are like just everybody. I'm talking world top three of every single person that's ever been surveyed on this. The interesting thing, though, that you said, though, was you said God, you said your sobriety, and you said your family. Every one of those things is all based on relationships. Your relationship with God, your relationship in that sobriety program is built on relationships, right? And then family. The top three things that everybody says, everybody says are the most important are relationships. So I want to ask this question as we are in this wisdom series, and that says, have you ever applied a wisdom, the most successful way of making a choice and a decision in your relationships? Have you ever applied wisdom? Have you ever done it all the time? I know, that, like, you can hear a pin drop right now, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, he outed me. I want to tell you a little bit of a story about bad wisdom in a relationship. And I'm going to tell you about my first crush that I ever had. Her name was Tamira. And I was 16, I believe, or grade 10, so yeah, about 16, 15. And I mean, I was in love. And uh, she clearly wasn't, but I mean, I was. And I thought for sure, though, she loved me, and I'd hang out with her all the time, right? I thought the relationship was a little bit more there than um, she did. Because one time, we went to her, uh, I was at school, went to her locker, and she opened the door. And then all of a sudden, on her locker, that he'd never seen before, said this, I love JC. So I see this, I love JC for the first time, and I'm like, JC, who's this JC guy, right? Clearly we are in love. I'm in love with this girl, right? Here's this JC. Now I'm going to have to go beat up this JC guy, right? Because <laughs> she's my property, right? You know, as you think in your young adolescent mind. Anyways, friends, JC was actually a... Um, initials j dot c and she put that on there because she became a christian and she wrote i love jc jesus christ right had i applied some wisdom to that whole situation with that relationship i probably wouldn't have been trying to pick a fight with jesus christ right <laughs> relationships they're important and we're going to dig into the Bible to see what that most important thing, relationships, how we can find some wisdom in that. And there's a ton of wisdom when it comes to relationships in the Bible. So we're going to have to really distill this down so that we can all walk away with something, some nuggets, and then hopefully go from there and grow from there. 
But here's the two, truth about relationships. And let's put this up here. Relationships that we have with our friends, our family, and our favorite partner requires wisdom in our interactions. Favorite partner, spouse, right? So relationships that we have with our friends, our family, and our favorite partner requires wisdom in our interactions. I wanted to do that little alliteration thing there, so that's why I didn't say spouse. So why do we need to apply wisdom to these relationships? And the reason for that is because they provide value for our lives. You know, first thing the Bible talks about when it talks about relationships is this. They are meant as a source of comfort. And I think that's something that we can all agree together on. Healthy relationships are meant as a source of comfort, right? Good, positive friendships, they can soothe, console, bring cheer. And that would go for every relationship with you have, with, that we have in our lives. Proverbs 17, 17 says this about relationships. Friends. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. So the, the Bible here is letting us know that, that, that a true friend is the one that loves always and is there for you in supporting adversity. And that's how we know who our friends are. That's the kind of friends that we uh, want to and, and are meant to invest time into. And the second thing that we find, not only do we find value in our relationships, and that's positive for us, relationships are also meant to be a good source of counsel, wisdom. Here's what it says in Proverbs 13, 20. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. You ever been in that scenario before? <laughs> Making dumb decisions because you're, you're out with your buddies, right? Or your girlfriends. You made some poor choices, right? The Bible's saying here, walk with the wise and become wise, for a company of companion of fools suffers harm. So the friends that we are meant to associate ourselves with are meant to also have those qualities of wisdom in their lives, not just knowledge, right? When we talked about that last week, knowledge is just about facts, right? Wisdom is applying facts to our lives. So it's not just about knowledge and our friends, right? In having relationships with persons that have those qualities of wisdom, we also, get, get, we also tend to make the same decisions of wisdom for our own lives. So relationships are meant to be a source of good counsel. That's what their purpose is. So that is the value of friendship in our lives, relationships in our lives. And it's important that we choose wisely when we're furthering those relationships. You see, the Bible also gives us some direction on those kind of relationships that are destructive for ourselves that we want to avoid in order that we might not follow down the same path. And here's what it says about relationships and the kind of people you don't want in your life, the kind of people that are gossips. Proverbs 20, 19 says this, a gossip betrays a confidence, so avoid anyone who talks too much. I know you're thinking to yourself right now when you hear that, and you're like, well, you know, I've got some friends that are gossip, and I kind of like it, but, you know, they never talk about me. They only talk about other people, right? Yeah, sure, they never gossip about you, right? They just don't do it in front of your face. So the Bible says we don't want to nurture that kind of a relationship with those sort of people in our lives, gossips, because they're destructive for us. And what that implies for all of us is this, too. You aren't being a good friend when you gossip, right? And also, if you value friendship and want to have friends, don't gossip. That's what the Bible is saying. The second kind of person that the Bible says that you don't want to have deep friendship or relationships with are people that are short-tempered. It says this in Proverbs 22, Do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. We've all known people that act that way, right? I had a friend who I was going to high school with, and uh, we, we would drive uh, from home to school in the mornings, and he would just get road rage all the time, right? He was that kind of a person, right, that he always would just get angry. And I remember driving with him some days and thinking to myself, I don't want to get punched in the face today. Like, I'm going to get in a fight here. He's going to get out yelling for some dumb reason, you know, because he's just so hot-tempered all the time. And I'm going to get my beautiful face will get messed up, right? And I don't want that, right? Close friends with a hot-tempered person, can also, at the same time, give you that same spirit and get you into some poor consequences from being hot-tempered, right? 
you're the hot-tempered person. Do you get a little hot-tempered at the same time, right? And that can create these problems for your life. And so the Bible is telling us that friendships, deep friendships, the ones that sustain you, the ones that are there for you in trouble, the ones that are there that are meant to be positive, aren't going to be found in people that are hot-tempered. The third thing the Bible says when it comes to our relationships and what we want to avoid at times is this. Proverbs 23 20 to 21, and, and it's people that are given to drunkenness and gluttony. Here's what it says. Do not be with heavy drinkers of wine or with gluttonous eaters of meat, for the heavy drinker and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe one with rags. Man, that's severe, isn't it? It's a deadly sin of overindulgence. And the Bible says to limit your time with those people in the situation that would tempt you to do the same thing because it will eventually ruin you. You know, Dave, you mentioned your most important relationship or the most important thing in your life is your sobriety. And I would, be, I would assume that when you hear this passage, do not be with heavy drinkers of wine or gluttonous eaters of meat, that there would have been times in your life with relationships that would have maybe caused you to go down that path. Is that a fair statement to make? I would say that based on the fact that my dad, too, is also... Uh, a, uh, is a sponsor with AA as well. And so he would say the same sort of thing for his life, right? Those relationships that can cause us to do things that are going to take us down a dark path, particularly in this case, given to drunkenness and gluttony, overindulgence, we want to minimize those relationships in case we go down the same road. You know, I was talking to Ian Davidson. I see him here today, and uh, we're glad you're back. He was just on a road trip. And he said this line that stuck with me. We, invent, we invite pleasure into our lives as a warm friend, only to find out it turns into like Uncle Eddie from Christmas Vacation, <laughs> who makes a mess out of everything and overstays its welcome, right? That's sometimes what we can do with pleasure in our lives, overindulgence that can create in us poor, uh, poor life for ourselves. The fourth person that we don't want to create, have, a, have a deep relationship with this is liars, un, the untrustworthy, and inconsiderate. Listen to this. It says this in Proverbs 25. Like a club and a sword and a sharp arrow is a man who bears false witness against his, la- his neighbor, a liar. Like a club and a sword and a sharp arrow is a man who lies against his neighbor. Like a bad tooth and an unsteady foot is confidence in a faithless man in a time of trouble. Anybody had bad tooth? Yeah, before? I, I, I had a uh, impacted tooth once. Man, that was the worst pain I've ever felt in my life. But what that is saying, what this metaphor is trying to say is this, like, if you're going to eat something and you got this bad tooth and you can't, you're starving, but you can't bite down on it because you know you're going to break this tooth or it's going to cause you a lot of pain. That is what having a friendship, a deep friendship with an untrustworthy person is. We don't want that kind of pain in our lives, do we? And the last part is this, like one who takes off a garment on a cold day or like vinegar on soda is he who sings songs to a troubled heart. If you're not a song, if you're not a singer, that's certainly true, isn't it, right? I think what the point is of that thing is being inconsiderate. It's not about singing a song to a troubled heart if you're trying to actually help a person out in the moment. The metaphor is trying to say, if if you're around people that are inconsiderate all the time, Well, that's not something you want to have in your life. And really, isn't that the truth, right? We don't want to have a friend like that in our lives. You know, can't quite trust the person, not always telling the truth all the time. You don't have really confidence in your relationship or your friendship. When bad times come and you need a friend, they're not there for you. You aren't sure if they're going to be there ever for you. Or the last one, someone who's really, really considerate in your life all the time. Those are the kind of friends the Bible is warning you to stay away from in your life. So why? Why is the Bible warning us of this wisdom about relationships we have? And I think it comes down to this, and this is from the New Testament. And Paul, and he says this in 1 Corinthians, do not be misled, bad company corrupts good character. Have you ever heard that before? That's a pretty famous saying, right? Do not be misled, bad company corrupts good character. Good character, living out what Jesus wants for our lives, that's what God wants for us, right? So maybe you're thinking to yourself right now, great, you've just mentioned the qualities of like 80% of all my friends. And if this is what the Bible is telling me is required of life and friends and stuff, basically you're telling me the Bible is saying, go live in a cave and become a hermit, right? 
And I don't think that's what the intention is of this in Proverbs, because it says in other areas, right, that we are meant to be the salt and the light of the world. And how can we possibly be that salt and light when we're living in a cave and not talking to people, right? See, how I interpret those passages is this, is that we can always be friendly and kind to people, but I do need to limit the amount of time that I have with deep, with acquaintances that it want to turn into deeper relationships so that I won't be affected negatively by those poor qualities. So we want to invest more time in the relationships that are life-affirming, life-giving. Find the friend or be the friend that God wants us to be. Now, thinking about that whole thing and on the flip side a little bit of this, is it comes a bit of as a reflective question to all of us, right? Do I have some of those same qualities in my life? Do I have some of those same qualities in my life? Hot-tempered. Lying. Overindulgence. Inconsiderate. Untrustworthy. Right? But that's true. I think the Bible is telling us those are things we need to work on in our lives because of the consequences of not making a change in those areas are going to cause us to not have life-giving relationships. Right? Why don't we go back? Think in your mind. We all decided... Relationships are the most important things in life. So the consequences of being a gossip, short-tempered, overindulgent, liar, trustworthy are, and this is what the Bible says, ensnared in loneliness, being in emotional and physical poverty and full of toxic aggression. That's not something we want for our lives, is it? So we want to work on those things to carve for us the person that people want to be around. So we want to stay in the negative. We want to go to the positive. And we want to think about some of the characteristics of being a friend or being a person that you want to have a relationship with and become the person you want to be. This is the sort of characteristics that you need to have for your life. And first thing is this, be slow to anger. Proverbs 15, 18 says this, losing your temper causes a lot of trouble, but staying calm settles arguments. Haven't you found that to be the case in your life? When we lose our temper in situations, they always become inflamed and resolution never gets found. I know that has been the case in my life because I have done that. And I found that when I lost my temper, the consequences of the situation were always worst, justified or not. So when we lose control of our anger, we create negative consequences for the situation. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but at some point, your loss of control will negatively impact your life. I lost my control once, or my cool once. I think it was at a drive through What a stupid place to lose your cool, man, a drive through You know, and afterwards, I mean, drove away, and I, I lost my cool. And, and, and these poor people, I mean, like, they're really in a drive through Like, they don't deserve somebody to lose their cool. I... Anyways, I drove, drove away. I think I got a hamburger. And I think it was about 30 seconds into the, as I was driving, thinking to myself, you know, I lost my cool. I wonder if they actually spit in my burger. And then, <laughs> and then I threw my burger out, right? <laughs> I, I know it's petty, right? But I mean, that consequences to our anger in things, right? We got to think about those things, right? So that's what the Bible says. Be slow to anger. So in every situation, every situation you find yourself in, remind yourself that your anger will always make this worse for yourself every time. And listen to this, and you can quote me on this. The consequences of your anger will always negatively exceed the justification for your lack of control. Are you here with me on that? I can promise you by <laughs> experience that that is the case. The consequences of your anger will always negatively exceed the justification for your lack of control. So the Bible says, be slow to anger. That's the kind of person, that's the kind of friend you need to be. The second thing the Bible is telling us in our relationships and how we interact with one another is be slow to respond. Proverbs 18, 13, and this is the Good News translation. And I picked this one because it's really harsh. Listen before you answer. If you don't, you are being stupid and insulting. That sort of digs in, doesn't it, eh? Be slow to respond. 
That's cutting at the heart of it, isn't it? And it's tied right to our anger that we just talked about. When we find ourselves in conflict from a friend or maybe even at work, human nature can cause us to get angry at a perceived injustice. And immediately, we start to make defensible arguments about what happened. I've talked about this before, and I know others have taken the same thing. Uh, it's a course that was, you know, they do it in the government a lot of the times too. And it talks about critical conversations. And one of the ideas of this critical conversations is this, is that when we find ourselves in conflict like that, we can create a narrative in our minds about why the conflict took place. We can get angry, and then that story that we created of why that person did that, well, then that's not even maybe the truth, but we create the story, and then that story gets built on and built on and built on until we get so angry about something that we are unable to fix the situation or maybe move forward or progress, right? Being slow to respond is the idea that you're listening to what happened in the situation, so have you ever done that? Have you ever been in a situation where you've created something, uh, this slight that took place that you thought it was like this, well, they did this because of this, and then that person did this because of this, and created that in your mind? Have you ever done that? Yeah. I mean, all of us have. It's human nature, right? So the Bible is saying be slow to respond. In being slow to respond, you're actually listening to the other person. When you find yourself in conflict, in that relationship, you want to be that kind of friend you want to be, you need to listen to what the conversation is. Because in not listening, he probably spoke too quickly. The situation became inflamed. The resolution wasn't achieved. You, you and me, were being stupid and insulting is what the Bible says, right? But when you truly listen, before you engage, it will illuminate and encourage true dialogue. Dialogue that helps to foster good, positive relationships. So being a friend, you want to be slow to respond. And the third thing, is this, when it comes to how do I be a good friend, how do I have good, positive relationships, what do I have to put on myself? And what the Bible says is Proverbs 10, 12, hatred stirs up quarrels, but love makes up for all offenses, right? See, when we let our anger and our hatred overcome our senses, we are meant to forgive. We remind ourselves in the moment of the same forgiveness that God poured out on us. When we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's what it says in the Bible. I remember when I was a kid growing up, and uh, I was almost against Christianity. Like, I would be to the point where I wouldn't even listen to Christian heavy metal music, like Striper. Did anybody feel familiar with Striper back in the 80s? They were this, like, Christian heavy metal band. They dressed, like, black with yellow stripe. They looked like bumblebees. Like, it was really dorky, but really cool at the same time because it was the 80s. And, um, I, I mean... I wouldn't even, and I knew about them, but in like in my, my journey of coming to Christ, that time I wasn't a Christian, I wouldn't even listen to it because I knew they were associated with Christ. I hated Christ. I hated what Christ standed for and what God standed for, right? But yet God still died for me on a cross. He sent people into my life that would share the good news of Jesus Christ with me. So it is an example to me of how that even in the midst of having a, a conflict with somebody, we are quick to show love. We are quick to offer forgiveness because God loved us and he forgave us. You know, to conclude, and we're going to go to communion at this time, and I'm asking Sarah to come on back up. Relationships are at the center of our existence. We've shown that they are the top three most important things in our life. They are crucial to our health and our happiness, and we treat them with love, and we value them. And we make sure that the deepening relationships we have are with the kind of people that God wants us to have those deep relationships with us. You know what? I think Shrek really sums it up best for us. Let's take a look at this video. Well, I'm through with you. Uh -uh. You know what? You is always me, me, me. Well, guess what? Now it's my turn, so you just shut up and pay attention. You are mean to me, you insult me, and you don't appreciate anything that I do. You're always pushing me around or pushing me away. Oh, yeah? Well, if I treated you so bad, how come you came back? Because that's what friends do. They forgive each other. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're right, Donkey. I forgive you. For stabbing me in the back. Oh! You're so wrapped up in Leia's onion, boy, you're afraid of your own feelings. Go away. See? 
There you are, doing it again, just like you did to Fiona. And all she ever do was like you. Maybe even love you. Love me? She said I was ugly. A hideous creature. I heard the two of you talking. She wasn't talking about you. She was talking about uh, somebody else. She wasn't talking about me? Well, then who was she talking about? Uh -uh, no way. I ain't saying anything. You don't want to listen to me, right? Right? Donkey. No. Okay, look, I'm sorry, all right? <sighs> I'm sorry. I guess I am just a big, stupid, ugly ogre. Can you forgive me? Hey, that's what friends are for, right? Right. Friends? Friends. Yeah, aw, isn't it? <laughs> so be the friend, the person that God wants you to be in your life. Find God's wisdom in the Proverbs. Apply it to every life and situation. Value friend relationships as the most important thing for your life, and you will find contentment that your soul is looking for. Let's pray together. Why don't you just close your eyes? Father, we are uh, examining your word today. Challenging, because... Uh, there's parts of every one of those people that you say not to associate that we've done. Lord, we've overindulged at times. We've lied at times. We've gossiped at times. We've been short-tempered at times, Lord. I know that's not the kind of people we want to be. So would you help us with those areas in our lives that we might uh, go back to the kind of person that you call us out to be? I pray, Father, too, is just as we're thinking about, you know, some of the positive things that we want to incorporate in our lives, being slow to anger. Help us to be that person, Lord, slow to anger. Help, help us to be slow to respond, Father. When we, Father, when we find ourselves in the relationship troubles or, or situations that might cause us to react defensively immediately and not listen, I pray, Father, you help us to listen so that, Father, we can come to a, a proper resolution in this. Help us to be quick to show love and forgive, Lord. I know you're going to do that, Lord, and you've, you've said it in your word, and Lord, we believe your word. You know, just as we, I'm talking right now to those of us that are here in this place, that maybe you don't know Jesus. You've got your eyes closed right now, and I, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to do anything other than just listen. You know, that most important relationship that we talked about, the top three most important things, the most important relationship is with God. As I said earlier, fearing of, fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Respect for God is the place we start in finding out how to create for ourselves a better today and an eternity. You know, today is the day that you can fix that relationship with God. But you need to take the first step. Recognize the relationship has been broken because of sin. And all of us have sinned in some ways. You know, it says in the Bible, in the Ten Commandments, do not murder. But remember what Jesus says? When you have hate in your heart, all of us have had hate in our hearts at some point. We have actually broken one of God's commandments. We may not have murdered anybody, but we've got hate in our heart. Or it says, do not, create, do not commit adultery. It says, and Jesus says, you know, even when you have lust in your heart, we've all lusted at some point in our lives. So all of us have broken God's commandments in some way. And that commandment breaking is what severed that relationship. And so in recognizing that we have sinned before God, we need to take the first step in fixing that relationship. And that first step is taking the leap of faith, asking him to forgive us of our sins and our desire and, have, and express a desire to nurture a relationship for a lifetime. That could be you today if you've never taken that first step. You know, at the end of the service, we're, we're going to dismiss. But if you want to help me to pray with you, I'm going to be up at the front and I'll pray along with you that you might want to take that first step. We just want to partner with you in your life journey. The life journey that changed for me so dramatically for the better when I accepted Jesus.